Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Welcome to Refreshing Time this beautiful Thursday afternoon. This is your hostess, speaker, Lady Ray Rosidoa. I'm excited to be here this afternoon to continue our series that we have been treating on this program. So, again, welcome to Refreshing Time. I'm here to inspire you, I'm here to equip you. I'm here to influence you to be a blessing to your family. I'm here to make kingdom impact. Refreshing time is supposed to bring all of us together around the authentic word of God, eliminating any errors out there that, you know, we see people preach and talk about. And so I pray that this is a big blessing to all of you today. Let me fix my little bar here. All right. So, um... If you have missed any of the other episodes, I encourage you to go back and take a look at it because it's building on precept upon precept. We dealt with the either a wife, godly wife. We dealt with marriage, bloodlines, and now we are moving on to a godly husband. So if you really want to be blessed, I encourage you to go back and take a look at the other episodes, and I hope that it will be a blessing on to you. Glory be to God. So. Um, let's start today's episode, episode number 23. Episode 23, today we are looking at Destiny Spouse, a godly husband. Yes, a godly husband. And I pray that this will be a blessing. Let's share a word, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the word. We thank you for what you're about to do. Holy Spirit, breathe on the word. Let it come alive. Let it get roots. Let it be written and inscribed on the tablets of our hearts that we will do it of the word and not just hear it. I pray that it will transform lives. I pray that it will change relationships. And I pray, oh God, that it will sow a seed in the heart, oh God, of a man who wants to please you and be that godly husband. And for the woman looking uh, to be found by her destiny husband or destiny spouse. I thank you, Spirit of a living God. I cover myself in the blood. I cover this episode in the blood of Jesus, that no weapon formed against us will prosper, but everything will go according to plan. The Father will be a blessing unto the hearers of this program. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. All right. So, I will be um, pulling up our scriptures as well um, for the program today so that we can look at scriptures at the same time and also look at what we are talking about. So let me start by saying that uh, for women, if you're a woman watching me, if you're married already, I thank God for your life. If your husband is a Christian, glory be to God. If he's not, um, I pray that, you know, he will find salvation with Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And, of course, if you're a Christian, you know your husband is a Christian, he's struggling a little bit, you know, being a godly husband. I pray that this will be a blessing to you and to him. Now, for those of you watching, you're a single man, you are not yet married, I pray that this will impact you greatly because you're going to learn the kind of a husband you ought to be um, so that you can be a blessing to that woman. Praise God. And if you're a single woman looking for um, a destiny spouse, destiny husband to marry, I pray that you take note of the attributes, the qualities, what we are looking for in a godly husband so that you don't miss it. When you meet him, you know this is a man because they're exhibiting all the attributes or qualities of a godly husband. Glory be to God. And so we're going to start, we're going to kick it off uh, going back to this familiar scripture in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, verses 24. Genesis 2, 24. This is after God, you know, had um, created Adam and Eve. Glory be to God. We are dealing with that. And so God, um, according to God's word, he said that it is not good it is not good that the man should be alone, but that a time will come that the man will leave his and his mother and cleave to his wife. Glory be to God. So let's read that. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined, joined, that's the key word, to his wife, will be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Glory be to God. Join the wife and become one flesh. So uh, you have to understand that as a woman, uh, you're supposed to be found by the man. We read that in Proverbs. If you remember when we did Proverbs uh, 
uh, 18, we're looking at the uh, a man who ever finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. We treated that. So the man is supposed to do the finding. He's supposed to be looking for you. If you're single, I believe God with you that you find that you know that destiny husband. And so the man's job is to leave and cleave. Where is he leaving? He's leaving if it's with his parents. He's leaving his father and his mother and cleave to you. Leaving as physically leaving, emotionally leaving, mentally leaving. <laughs> that whole. Uh, uh, whole deal. He's not just living physically and then he's attached to the mom or dad and he's not attached to you. So when we say leave and cleave, you're leaving all these things you are connected to as a man to your biological parents or adoptive parents or whoever is a parent onto you. Glory be to God. And you are cleaving. You're going to be joined. You're going to become one flesh. Yes, physically, you're going to have sexual intercourse with your wife when you marry her. You're going to be of one flesh when you come together. You're going to um, go on a journey to become one with the woman as in your thinking, your thought process. It's going to, at some point in time, begin to merge, to be, you know, be thinking alike, thinking along some similar or familiar lines. Praise God. And so you leave and cleave. So emotionally, you're going to cleave to your new wife. Uh, mentally, you're going to have to start rethinking and thinking like a husband and thinking like the, the, the man you ought to be to that woman that God has given on to you. Glory be to God. And so um, for a man, there's a lot that is on your shoulders if you're watching. You know, yes, there's a lot on the woman, but for you, the man, there is a lot on your shoulders. And we're going to learn about that today in the episode 23 because you are the one doing the leaving and cleaving. Not that the woman who shouldn't also cleave to you, but there's a lot for you to leave behind. You're going to leave behind your independent way of thinking. You're going to leave behind doing things your own way, however you wanted it. You're going to have to leave that behind. You're going a lot of things you're going to leave behind and 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 come up with different compromises because now you've taken somebody's daughter, you know, in as a wife and you've cleave to her and so you have to come together with her making sure that you are aligning spiritually you are aligning physically you are aligning emotionally you are aligning mentally psychologically all those have to come together so if you're a man watching there's a lot on your shoulders but it's a good thing if you know god it's a good thing if you have a relationship with god why because it's easier on you it's way easier on you because you're able to talk to God and God is able to give you the download. God is able to bless you. God is able to equip you with whatever it takes to be that godly husband. Now, if you're not a Christian, I don't know what your faith is, but I pray that God helps you. Amen. And I'm only speaking in the context of a Christian man, a godly man. Amen. And so you're leaving and cleaving. Now, there is something that I want us to look at in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. If you have your Bible with me, let's go to 1 Corinthians um, chapter 11, verse 3. Now, it talks about Christ being the head of the man. He said, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. And so if you're looking at maybe if we're looking at a, a chart, you put the Godhead on God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Son of the living God, is the head of every man. So you have, you know, the, you know God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You have Jesus being the head of the man, and then, of course, the man is reporting to Jesus, glory be to God, and then the Bible says that the woman is reporting to the man, so you got the woman reporting, if you're talking about reporting in that order, the woman reporting to the man, the man reporting to Christ. Christ in front of the Godhead. Amen. I hope that blessed you in a way. So um, you must understand as a man, you are the head. As a man, you are the head um, of the home. Uh, single man, married man, I pray that this blesses you. Because you are the head, that means that you, number one, must have a relationship with God. Listen, woman, if you're looking for a man to marry, you need to look out for a godly man, a Christian man, a man who has a relationship with God, a man who understands this headship. That he's not off his own. He's not on his own either. That he must submit to God. He must have a relationship with God. He must be in a, a submissive relationship to God. A man who is not submitted to God, I can tell you, you're going to have problems. Yes. If that man doesn't have a relationship with God, I'm sure it might work in whatever terms or, or principles you guys come up with, but it's going to be more difficult. 
I can tell you for a fact that a man who has a godly relationship with God, he's a born again Christian. He knows God. He loves God. He walks with God, talks with God. It's easier to be in a marital relationship with such a man as a Christian woman. Why? Because you know, this person also has a relationship with God, just like you have a relationship with God. We understand that, you know, that third, fourth quarter in a relationship cannot be easily broken. And so you are in relationship with woman. Man, you are in relationship with God. It's never love this relationship. All of you are connected to God in that relationship. Praise God. Amen. And so if that man does not have a relationship with God, I'm telling as a Christian woman, walk away. Because that is the first thing you need to look out for. I don't understand why sometimes we Christians, we come up with all these ideas. Sometimes women will say, well, I'm going to marry him and I will change him. I will convert him. Well, God has not given you that assignment. That is not your assignment. God didn't tell you to go and convert that man. Now, if God did, that's a different story altogether. That will be different on its own. But as a woman, if you're joining, if you just joined, this is episode 23. Uh, we're looking at Destiny's Spouse a godly husband, that's what we're looking at, we're looking at point number one, that that person must have a relationship with God, and we just read from 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, yes, relationship with God, if there is no um, headship, relationship for the man, I'm sorry, walk, the Bible says darkness and light cannot be yoked together, an unbeliever should not be marrying a believer, even we remember when we were treated easier in the other episodes, even a Christian trying to marry um, somebody from a different faith, that is not Christianity. And even bringing it home, a Christian, because we have different denominations with different traditions of man and different church traditions and differences in belief, you could be a, both of you could be Christians, all right, but maybe the, the denomination you belong to have different sets of beliefs that might impact the raising of your children or that might impact you ruling that house or, or or, you know, building that home with that woman. And so that's going to be a problem. For example, let me give you an example. Let's say you, the man, belong to a charismatic Pentecostal church. You're a Christian, born again. You believe in speaking in tongues. You believe in the gifts of the spirit. You believe you believe in the, in the um, fivefold ministry. You believe all that. And then you're married a woman from, yes, she's a Christian, all right, but the denomination where she belongs to or fellowship that, they don't believe in speaking in tongues. Now, you're going to come home and you, the man, want to pray in tongues and she say, uh-uh, we ain't doing that in here because Okay, so right there and then there's a problem. There is confusion already set in the home because you believe different. What if the woman believes in infant baptism? And the man said, no, 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 we ain't doing infant baptism. We're going to wait for that child to be at the age of accountability. Then we're going to baptize that child by, you know, water by immersion. There's confusion there. So again, I'm bringing it home again into this, looking at a godly husband. Make sure this husband that you are getting married to or this man you're married to, you have, want to understand that he has a believing relationship with God, a faith-based relationship with God. You got on the same page, born-again Christian, personal relationship with God, hopefully similar uh, similar um, faith backgrounds as in maybe denomination, so that you guys have no um, vast differences that will cause problems. I'm not saying that people are not willing to compromise, but wouldn't it be better right from the get-go so that you don't have any issues? So you, the man, godly man, you are the head. Get that. Understand it as a man. You, you, you will submit to God. If you can't submit to God, you're going to have problems with the woman submitting to you. Praise God. So again, that's 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 2. So the reason why your relationship with God is important is because you as a man, you are the priest of the home. You are the intercessor of the home. I say that you are the king of the home. You are the prophet of the home. You occupy all these roles as a man. Don't forget you are created in the image and the likeness of God. So you're like, uh, uh, Reverend Rosie, what do you mean by all these roles? Now, the reason I'm saying that is we all know that Jesus was king, prophet, and priest. You're the man you are created in his image as well. Now, as a man, if you have a relationship with God, you will understand what kingship is. Now, if you're a king, if you understand kingdom principles, a king has sovereign authority. A king has authority over a territory, over a domain. That's a king. A king makes a decree. A king can, can um, decree and make things law. A king has 
subjects who report to him. Again, because you are in charge of a domain or a territory, definitely you have a constitution that rules that territory. For us Christians, the Bible is our constitution. We go by the word of God. The same way as a man, if you are the king of the home, you must understand that you are coming in. That home is your territory. Praise God. So I'm, I'm liking you to kinship. That, that home is going to be your territory. It's going to be your domain. You're going to rule and reign in that territory. Glory be to God. And of course, every king has a queen. So you're going to have a queen with you in your home, which who is your is there or your wife. Amen. But as a king, you must understand that you have to have strong biblical principles because you have to enforce that in your home. Now, if you are not able to enforce the word of God in your home, king of the house, you can enforce the word of God in your home, you're going to have problems because you're going to have a wife who wants to do something different. You're going to have children who want to behave different. My God, that is not your portion. You don't want it to be difficult for you to be that godly man in that house. So as, as a man, don't forget, you, you, the attributes of a king is embedded in your spirit, man. You have to have that understanding and be ready to uh, defend your territory, be able to provide for your territory, the welfare of the home. Everything is in your hand as a man. So it's important for you to have a relationship with God so you can understand from a biblical standpoint, you can understand from scripture what scripture demands of you as the head of the home. You would understand from the word of God, God's expectation of you as a man of the home or as the head of the house. So point number one, you must have a relationship with God. If you're a woman, like I said, if the man is not a born again Christian, run. If, if you guys are not on the same page, run, because it's going to be a lot of problems. I have a relative. She married um, somebody of a different faith, um, totally uh, you know, outside Christianity. And she said in the beginning, the man said it was okay with her. Um, she could go to church. She could do whatever. Uh, two, three kids, kids down the road. Now he said, no, I, you can't do it. You can't go to, go to church. You need to come with me to go here and, and all that. So it became a, a, a bone of contention in the home because she said, that's not what you told you told me I was free to worship God the way I came in. Now, why are you changing uh, the rules to it? So, again, remember that. Point number two, if you are watching me um, as a man, let's go to point number two, why you are um, why you are supposed to be that godly husband of the home. Every woman watching me, the man is the spiritual leader of the home. The spiritual leader. Now, when it comes to salvation, we are all equal before God. Don't. Don't ever think the man is higher than you when it comes to salvation. When it comes to you and I being saved, born again, sanctified, justified, all that. A man and a woman, we are the same before God. Salvation, we have, we have no differences. It's just that when it comes to our roles in marriage, there are differences. I hope that makes sense to somebody today. Amen. So let's look at the word of God. We are reading from Ephesians. We're looking, looking at Ephesians today. And um, we're going into Ephesians Chapter 5, verse 23, Ephesians 5, 23. Actually, I'll be reading out in there for a while, so let me just pull out my scriptures. But Ephesians chapter 5, 23, it says, For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is Savior of the body. Praise God. He said, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Verse 25, um, Ephesians chapter 5, 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes, just as the Lord does the church. Glory be to God. I've just read from Ephesians chapter 5, from verses 23 to 28. It's heavily packed, so let's break it down. Point number two, the, the qualities you're looking for in you, you yourself, if you're a man, what you need to understand that you are the spiritual leader of the house. And um, because you are the spiritual leader, the Bible says you are the head of the wife. The wife must submit you and you must submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Spiritual leader. You are the spiritual leader. You are supposed to do a few things that we are about to break down. 
as a spiritual leader of this house, a few things we're supposed to do. Number one, under you being a spiritual leader, you are an intercessor. You are the priest of the home. You must stand in a place of intercession for that woman and for that house. My God, you are the spiritual leader. You must be a prayerful man. You must be a man of prayer. A man who doesn't pray, you're going to have challenges in your home. A man who is not interceding for the wife and the children, you're going to have problems in the home. And the reason being this, because you are the head, when you pray, God is able to show you things that maybe are coming to the family, whether it's a blessing or it's not a blessing, whether it's an attack or not, you, the man, will be able to discern and know the seasons you are in for that house. You'll be able to discern and know if God wants you to go, uh, you know, path A or path B. Without you being prayerful and connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, you are not connected to the Holy Spirit. You are not connected to God the Father. You will not have any sense of direction where you are going. A man, a godly husband, must have a prayerful life. As a spiritual leader of your home, you must have a prayerful life. You might not necessarily be a prayer warrior, but you must pray. You must seek the face of God because every decision you're making, because Christ is your head, you need to talk to him. What does Proverbs chapter 3, 46 says? It says what? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and God will direct your path. If you can trust God, if you're not in that relationship with him, if you're not in that spiritual leadership role, how would you trust God with all your heart? How would you acknowledge him in all your ways, in, in your job, in your business, in your investment, in your building? How are you going to do that? And how is God going to direct your steps. So you need that. You, the man, you're not going, yes, you may get counsel maybe from your friends or from your wife, but the, the source that is ordering your steps in life must be God. You are the spiritual leader. So you need to be a man of prayer. A prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. You have no power. Do you understand why a lot of men are encountering a lot of problems in their homes? It's because most of them, when you check them out, they are not prayerful. Even those who are prayerful are encountering problems, let alone those who are not praying. <laughs> That's a big one. Amen. Now, listen, I'm reading from verse 25. It says, actually, yes. So verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. You are the spiritual leader. It is your role, it's your responsibility to teach the word of God to your wife. Did you know that? We just read it, Ephesians 5, 26. The Bible says you are supposed to wash the woman with the word. You are supposed to help set her apart on the journey that she's on. It said you will sanctify and cleanse her. You set her apart and cleanse her with the word. So a man who does not know the word of God cannot sanctify and cleanse the woman with the word of God. How are you going to do it? It's sad because sometimes you find... Um, couples where the woman is more knowledgeable in the word of God, really, like women sometimes are way rooted and grounded in the word than the man. So this is where sometimes the man might say, like, oh, why are you trying to control me? Why are you trying to tell me what to do? No, she's not trying to do that. She just knows the word. And maybe because she's sharing scriptures with you, or it, it, it's like the roles have reversed in a way. She's the one teaching you the word. So you're going to feel some kind of way. So if you're a man and you don't know the word yet before you get married, get into the word, get to know the word of God for yourself. Why? Because you have a responsibility according to Ephesians chapter 5, 26, that you are supposed to sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. You're supposed to be doing that home Bible study. You're supposed to be doing that home quiet time. You're supposed to be teaching or impacting the word of God to your wife and to your children by your actions, by your doings. They should see that you are living scripture. Praise God. That's why it makes you the spiritual leader of the home. You have to be the one. Now, it's okay if you marry a woman who knows the word equally or better or whatever. Praise God, all the better. But you have to have that understanding that don't stay at that level of knowledge in the word. Go in the word of God. Go deep in the word so that you can impact that wife. Because you might have a woman that you need to use the word of God to expand to them, to teach them their role as a wife or a mother in the home. You'll be using the word to talk to this woman to help her become more mature. This word that you might be impacting to that woman or that wife, believe you me, will help the woman to become better. She'll be more matured in her dealings with you. If your wife is misbehaving, we may or that that uh, 
destiny spouse that you intend to marry, if she's not lining up with certain things spiritually when it comes to the word of God, I can tell you have work to do. So that makes you the leader. You must be in a place of intercession. I'm going before God and talking to God on behalf of your family. Amen. The reason why I need you to, as a man to be the spiritual leader of the house is because you're going to go through challenges in life. When you come into challenges in life, you realize that you need to rely on God. You need to go back to God. You lean on God for everything. If you are not in that spiritual leadership position as an intercessor to stand in the gap for your children, stand in the gap for your wife, you are in trouble. You are in trouble as a man. And so it's important that you understand that you are the spiritual leader. You are the priest. You are that intercessor of the home. You speak the faith of God concerning that family. It doesn't mean that because you are the spiritual leader, your wife has no say so. Your wife doesn't count. Your children might not even know. The, no, it doesn't mean that. It's just for your own self to be in a place of authority, to be in a place of influence, to be in a place that you can impact the word of God to your family. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So you must understand, spiritual leader, you must be prayerful, okay? We looked at point number one, relationship with God. Point number two, you are the spiritual leader of the home. And as the spiritual leader, we are establishing that you are the priest, you are the intercessor of the home. You must be able to do that. Seek the faith of God for that home. That's, that you should be prayerful. Number two, you should know the word of God. Amen. Prayerful knowing the word of God, so you can impact it to your wife who just read it in the word of God. Amen. Amen. Now, point number three. So point number one, relationship with God. Point number two, spiritual leader. We have two stop points, prayerful, knowing the word. Point number three, the main point number three, every godly husband, a man who is a godly husband, a godly man must be loving. God commanded you, the man, to be loved. He didn't command you to do anything else. Say you be loved. You would wonder, like, so why should God command the man to love? I thought loving is easy. I thought loving is just, you know. Now don't forget, in a relationship, you have agape love, the unconditional love of God. You have filio or phileo, which is brotherly love, sisterly love, and you have eros or erotic love, which is sexual love, all those come together to make marriage what it is. So what am I telling you right now? What I'm telling you is point number three, a husband must be loving. It's a command. It's not an option. It's not a point of negotiation. God commands you to love. And what kind of love is God commanding the man to love? God commands you to love her unconditionally, agape love. Listen, Ephesians chapter 5, we just read it. Ephesians 5, verse 25, the husbands love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her. We just did that. So if you are loving the church like Christ loved the church, that means you must have a sacrificial love as a man. A man who cannot sacrifice for his home, cannot sacrifice for his children, cannot sacrifice for the wife. It's a big question mark. So you as a man right now, ask yourself, are you able to demonstrate sacrificial love? Are you able to give of yourself to be a blessing to others? Are you able to uh, uh, give of yourself, pour into the lives of others, sacrificing your own comfort, sacrificing your own luxury, sacrificing certain things, your time and your talent and all that? Are you able to sacrifice? So if you're a single man and you cannot sacrifice right now, I don't know if you can do it when you get married. Because there are certain men, they are selfish, they are greedy, they cannot give up something for the benefit of another. So you the woman, when you are courting this man, and you realize this man cannot sacrifice, it's a big question mark. He's not going to change when he marries you. I keep telling people, it gets worse. If they get better, then hallelujah, Jesus is doing a good work in their life. What do I mean that it gets worse? Who they are is what you get. Go into marriage, having the mindset as 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 is. You know when you go to a parking lot or and you're buying a car and they say as is, that means whatever defect is in the car is what you get. You cannot come back and say, well, I bought the car and now the car has a, the worn out, the tires are worn out and, and now the brake is giving me a problem. No, as is. So woman, when you meet a man, a single man you want to marry, if he's not loving, you have a problem. If he's not sacrificial in nature, you have a problem. If he's selfish, if he's greedy, he will be the same thing when you marry him unless God does a transformative work in him. And I keep telling people, it's only Jesus, it's only the Holy Spirit that 
can transform lives, that can change hearts, that can change character traits of people. You, the woman, cannot go in there and say, I'm going to change him. He's going to sacrifice for me. No. And naturally, a loving man, anybody who is loving, is willing to sacrifice. Somebody who is not loving, I don't know. If you're loving, you can't sacrifice a big question mark. That means that you are the kind of person that when you love, you expect something in return. You know, but with benefits. I'm loving you and I'm expecting to give me something in return. I'm not saying that relationship is not mutually beneficial. It is. But when it comes to unconditional love, it's almost like it's like a one-way street. Because you're giving the love whether you get it back or not. When Jesus died on the cross, yes, the expectation was for us to accept him as Lord and personal Savior and be saved. Glory be to God. But there are people who today, they have free will. They reject that love. They don't accept the love of God. God can't force them because of free will. Yet there are consequences if you reject him. Yeah, yes it is. So what am I saying? Point number three, a loving man. Your husband must be loving. You're a man. You must be a godly husband, godly spouse. You must be loving. Are you willing to love that woman as Christ loved the church? Now, let me break it down for you, some of us. Do you see how God loves you and I? Do you see how we make mistakes over and over and over again, and we still ask for forgiveness, and God forgives us, and God takes us back, and God never rejects us? That is the kind of love God is asking from the man. Unconditional love, ever forgiven, ever given, ever loving. <laughs> and so don't say, I'm sick and tired of forgiving this woman. She does this every time I'm tired of it. Well, is God tired of you already? I don't think God is tired of you. I don't think God has rejected you. I don't think God has forsaken you. So for a man telling a woman, I love you, you are telling her, I am a, a Christian man for that matter. You are telling her that I love you with the love of God. I love you with the agape love. I love you with sacrificial love. I love you that I'm willing to lay down my life for you as a woman. Okay, let me take it down further. Loving that woman, it said, just like Christ laid down his life. Every loving husband has this in him that I'm here to defend that woman with my life. Nobody can touch this woman. Nobody can mess with my woman as a man. That's the position you're in. If you're a man and you allow anybody else to take advantage of your wife, of that woman, your love has not matured to that level. You should be her defender. You should be her protector. You should be the one delivering her from harm's way. Yes, God is going to use you, but you should be the one at post to make sure that that woman is untouchable, that woman, nobody can mess with her. You have a big role to play, man. If you're a man listening to me, it's no joke. That command God gave you, it's going to take you a lifetime of maturity. I can tell you that because you are not there yet. You're going to get hurt. The woman might reject you sometimes. The woman might act a way that you don't like. The woman might say certain things you don't like. At the end of the day, you are supposed to love her like Jesus. If Jesus can forgive me, take me, wash me, cleanse me, love on me, you're supposed to do the same as a man. Now, it doesn't mean I should take advantage of you and abuse your love and act a fool. No. As a woman, you must wisen up and also mature along with a man. But I'm just letting you know, when you, the man, go into that marriage as is, what you get from the woman is what you get. Where if she improves, if God transforms her, it's a blessing to you and it's a blessing to her. If not, love her as she is. That's why you said, I love you and I want to make you my wife. You saw what you saw and you said, this is good enough for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So that man must be loving, sacrificial love, willing to lay down your life. A man must protect the woman. I heard a story of a certain man who said armed robbers came to his home. They wanted to rob them. They, you know, take their money and all that. And they wanted to rape the woman. He said, you can have, he told them, you can have everything in my house, but you cannot have my wife. You would have to go through me to get to my wife. And if it means you got to kill me first, then so be it. Wow. A love that is willing to put their life on the line. Some men will chicken out and still understand and say, do what you want to do with that. It's okay. We'll, we'll both live. <laughs> now, if you choose either or, I'm not judging you, but I'm just giving you an example of a man who was willing to lay down his life for the woman. Laying down your life for the woman. So physically, you have to protect her. If there's harm coming to you, make sure the woman is protected. Number two, laying your life means you're going to sacrifice your time.
time, your sweat, your resources, so that this woman can be better. She can look better. She can look good. Now, let me read a scripture to you, man. It says, uh, it says here in Ephesians chapter 5, we read in verse 27, it says that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she should be holy and without blemish. Listen, as a man, when you marry a woman, everybody should know that you are a blessing to her. Because the way the woman was when you married her, she should look better physically. She should, um, she should mature better emotionally. Communication in her achievements and everything in life, we should see that you've made impact on the woman. You are presenting her without wrinkle or blemish, just like Jesus is presenting us without wrinkle or blemish before the Father. A glorious church. You are presenting a glorious wife. That's why you see a lot of women, when they become misses, they look so good. Man is doing a good job. They are improving. Some men will make sure they sponsor the woman to go to school, get a better education. They want to make sure she has a better job. Yes, that's what a man does. You don't rather sit on the woman, push her down, kick her to the side. No, the woman should be better off from the point that you took her from her home. Better off emotionally, better off psychologically, better off uh, mentally, better off physically. If you meet a woman who is tattered, you meet her and she, she, she's not properly clothed. She doesn't look well kept together. Hair is always a mess. Body is always a mess. The man is doing a poor job. What? Getting the woman to that level. You are doing a poor job. You are not presenting her to be glorious. She should reflect you. The woman reflects the man. A well kept woman. A beautiful woman. A woman who is achieving, going somewhere in life, is a reflection of the husband, of a godly husband. Any man who doesn't want the wife to be better has a problem because you making your ether better, it's your own advantage. <laughs> the better she gets, the more peace of mind you have at home, the better you're going to accomplish things in life. So when the Bible says Christ is presenting Christians without wrinkle or spot or blemish from Ephesians chapter 5 verses 27 as we read, it's the same thing for the man because they love the woman like Christ loved the church and present her without blemish. Don't let her family people say, we regret giving this woman to you as a wife. We regret that she went into this marriage. She's worse off than when she was when she left home. That will not be your testimony as a man and also as a woman. So as a man, make sure that your love, your loving, that's point number three, that your loving is a gap in love, unconditional love. It's sacrificial. You can sacrifice your life physically, and you can sacrifice your life in your time, in your resources, your money, everything to make her better and make her glorious. That is the love that God commands you as a man. That's the, that's the command God has given to every godly husband. If you do not obey this command, you are you are sinning. You are loggerheads with God at this point. So if you're married and your husband is not godly, he's not showing sacrificial love, pray to God that God will touch his heart. But pray to God that if he develops a strong relationship with God, he'll be able to walk as a godly man and understand what Ephesians 5 is requiring from him as a husband. Glory be to God. He must be loving. He must be loving. Being a loving husband. Now I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 3 verse 19. Colossians 3.19. It says the husbands should love their wives and they should not be harsh with them. Ooh, don't be harsh. Now, are you surprised that you see some men they are so harsh with their wives? It's ridiculous. Like, I'm like, do you even know the word of God? Do you read the word? You don't read the word, so you don't know what you're doing. It's a husband, love your wife and do not be bitter towards them. Do not be harsh towards them. Why? Because the Bible sees women um, as a weaker vessel. Now, when I say a weaker ver a vessel, let me elaborate here. We are not talking that the woman is weak as being the is there, being a comparable help me to help the woman. The woman is operating from a place of strength. But women, the way of or, or females, the way God God created us, you should understand that we are emotional beings. Very emotional. A few women you might meet, they are not emotional. Okay, they are just what the one percent. But most women are emotional. When I say emotional, we express sentiment. We, we, we have that aspect of us that makes us nurturing or nourishing. That's why in the home you see a mother is a nurturer and the father is a disciplinarian. Sometimes you might find the woman being a disciplinarian as well. But I'm coming from the feminine side. The feminine side. 
That's why I said, take your time to deal with this. Because if you deal bitterly with a woman, if you deal harshly with a woman, you might get a crying baby in the house. <laughs> you might get a woman who's all distraught. You might have a woman who is all messed up emotionally, mentally, like whatever. Like when a woman is messed up, everybody's going to be messed up in the house because she's not in what? In balance. She's not in equilibrium whatsoever. What do they say? Mama happy, everybody happy, right? Praise God. So you want to make sure as a man, the Bible says in Colossians 3.19, that the godly husband will not do harsh. If you're dating somebody and they're harsh in their words, they're harsh towards you, they treat you bad. Why do you want to proceed to marry them? It'll be worse. If, if he's verbally abusive when he's courting you, he will be the living Jesus out of you when he marries you. I tell you, he's, it's not going to get any better. The man is calling you all kinds of names. He calls you all the letters we can think about. What makes you think that when he marries you, his, his words towards you is going to be sweet and soft? Even those who are sweet and loving, when they want to get harsh with you, look at how it feels like. Look at how it feels like. So, again, the communication of the man. He said the man should deal with the women. They should love them and not be bitter towards them. A loving person does not communicate harshly. I'm not saying you can't raise your tone. I'm not saying you cannot be angry. You might get upset. It happens in, in a relationship, in marriage, in life, period. But I'm talking about when you deal harshly with a woman. You use your mouth to demean her, downgrade her, walk all over her. You do harshly. The man who abuse women verbally and physically, you got a problem. Go get, go get checked. You got a problem. Because you know that this woman is no match to you, yet you're using her as a punching bag. If you're in a relationship and you're being abused physically, leave that relationship. If you're not married to the person yet, it's your ticket out. Leave. Don't keep telling yourself, oh, he said he's sorry. Oh, he said um, whatever. He promised not to hit me again. How many times have we seen it? They promise and they keep coming back in. Oh, well, when I get angry, I, I just hit you. I beat you up. And then I come back and I apologize and we make up. If this is the order of the day, you are in trouble, woman. If you're looking for that godly husband, that is not it. He is not. He is not supposed to be beating you up, abusing you. How many Christian marriages haven't we heard that the women have died in the relation or the men have died in a relation because of abuse? Abuse is, is, is not acceptable. Colossians 3.19, don't do harshly with a woman. Don't lay your hands on her. Don't slap her. Don't kick her. Don't beat her up. Some men beat their pregnant wife. My God. Like, are you okay? Go get help. Go see a psychologist. Go see a, a Christian counselor, a pastor, somebody. Maybe you might have to go through deliverance and deal with your anger or your temper. It's not good. God didn't put us there for us to be abused. Likewise, the women who abuse the men, you beat them up and do all that. You, you, you are not of the hook either. But because you're talking about a godly husband, I have to stay on the man. To make my glory be to God. So don't do treacherously. When you read Malachi chapter 2, verse 4, I believe it says, you should not do treacherously with a woman. Don't do treacherously with her. Don't. Some men do. And the Bible says that it will be a hindrance to your prayer. God will never listen to that prayer when you pray as a godly man because you don't know how to love the woman. Number four. Point number four that we are making today. Point number four. Point number four for a godly husband. We are looking at First Peter, First Peter chapter three verse seven. First Peter three seven. I know the women are getting blessed over there. The men are getting blessed. Amen. First Peter chapter three verse seven. What does it say? It says, "Husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding." Number four. If you're looking for a godly husband, he must be a man of understanding. A man who does not understand Jack ain't going nowhere with you, girl. <laughs> a man who doesn't have understanding, doesn't understand life, doesn't understand how what women go through, doesn't understand you as a woman, as a wife to be, you are in trouble. I always tell people that women are not the same. Some women you might find very complicated because of the way we they, they reason or the way they see things. So when somebody says, Oh, the woman is so complicated, what do they mean? I always ask that question. Maybe her way of reasoning, her way of thinking through things, her way of making decision, uh, decisions in life, everything she does is not the regular way that most people think or behave. Let me break it down further for the man. When I say you are a man of understanding, I would say dwell with them with understanding. If you're a man and 
you are married, let's say you are married to a professional woman or you are dating a professional woman, ordinary. Maybe the woman could be a lawyer, a professor, teacher, lecturer, nurse, medical doctor, engineer, whatever. They, they're regular professions in life. They naturally probably fall in very analytical um, spectrum. They are high thinking people. If you are dating courting a woman who is high thinking, high achieving, they don't settle for less. They don't settle for mediocre. They don't settle for uh, let's do it anyhow and let's move on kind of person. If you don't dwell with them with understanding, you might always think they are controlling. You might always think they want to be the boss of you. You might, you might, you wouldn't know how to handle that woman. It's a problem for a lot of people. So know that woman. That woman who is supposed to be thinking on her feet. Let's say you are, you are courting, I'm using a medical doctor, for example. You are courting somebody who is a medical doctor or maybe an attorney. They're always thinking too, always reading in between the lines, always diagnosing, always looking for solutions, always making decisions on their goal. That, 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 that's the nature of the beast, if I want to put it that way. What are you supposed to do if you don't have understanding of that person's personality, their career, their occupation, the way they think, behave, and interact? You will always find problems with them. I'm not saying that they should write over you because of their profession or because of what makes them who they are in whatever area is their occupation, but you must have understanding of it because it will transcend the relationship, it will be brought into the home, their decision making, the way they go about things. I have this spiritual daughter. And she's very analytical. If you told her this plant will be moved from here to here, she's thinking, well, why does she say it has to be moved? And when is it going to be moved? And why can't it stay there? And while it's moving, what will happen in between? Now, when it gets there, what am I supposed to do? That's how she used to think. So maybe something simple becomes overcomplicated. <laughs> Reading too much in, into it, right? So you, the man, the Bible says you should be a man of understanding. This is one of the key areas a lot of people miss, and they start labeling women. They are bossy. They want to be the boss of me. They are controlling. They are this, they are that. No, you fail to understand what you're dealing with. Now, again, women could have all these attributes, but they are still submissive. They are still willing to listen to you as a man. They are still willing to follow your lead. I tell people, if you are a man and you fail to lead, no woman will follow you. No woman is going to follow somebody who doesn't know how to lead. Women want to be led. I keep telling people, no woman wants to wear the pants in the home. Who wants to wear the pants in the home? Who wants to be the man in the home? No. Women want to be loved, pumped, laid back, be sweet, whatever. She could be a billionaire. It doesn't matter. She wants to be the husband of the home. So don't ever think, you know, she, she wants to wear the pants. No, that's not what it is. But what are you doing as a godly man? You must have an understanding. To know that when it comes to the house, if I don't give the woman a clear vision, where the family is going, what we are building, what we are working towards, what our ideals are as a family, what our family culture is going to be, what our commitment and loyalty in life is going to look like. If you are not like that, the woman might not follow you and she might be doing her own thing because you're not giving her strong leadership. Lead and let her follow. If you lead, she will submit. If you are not harsh, she will submit. Like women will submit to a godly husband who is not harsh, who is not bitter, who is not mean, who is loving them. Like, who would not submit to that? We would submit 24-7 if I give her 36 hours a day. We would. It is what it is. But, you know, people don't want to hear that. So, again, the man must be a man of understanding. You must be able to understand as, as, uh, the woman's temperament. Is she a sanguine? Is she a melancholic? Is she a phlegmatic? What is she? All the four temperaments. You have to know that. Is she a choleric? If your woman is a sanguine and you don't understand it, now you start complaining. Well, everywhere we go, she wants to be seen. She wants to be friends. Da, 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 da. I'm not saying she should be out of control, but you must understand her temperament. You must understand her personality before you get into marriage with her so that you don't get offended. Maybe you are the laid back kind and you can't take it. You just can't. I can take this woman just being all over the place. Well, don't marry her then because you, you will not take it. It's not going to change. It's her temperament. She's not going to change be who she is. It's just going to compromise a little bit and curb it down, you know, curb it down a little bit. You know, I, like my personality, I'm a huggy kind of person. I like to hug people more than handshake. But I had to tone it down a little bit as a married woman. So everybody, you want to go hug. <laughs> I 
Am I offended? No, I'm not. You need to give a little bit, take a little bit, give a little bit, take a little bit. So you as a woman, you should be able to do that. And as a man, so don't get jealous and say, well, she's all loving and she's all this. And you, the man, you're going crazy because this woman, you think she's out of control. She is not. Do you understand her personality? Do you understand her temperament? If you do, it would be so easy for you to deal with a woman. I would say tell but the women are not that. No, it's, we are very simple. Know your woman, not every other woman. Know your woman. The woman you think you can live with. The woman you think you can marry. So a godly husband is a man of understanding. Does he understand the way you express emotion? When you are angry, when you are sad, does a man have that mind of understanding? Maybe when my wife is sad, I have to leave her alone. Maybe when my wife is upset, I have to do this. Or when the woman I want to marry, she's angry, she likes to go for a walk. She likes to go for a drive. She likes to yell. She likes to do whatever. You have to have a mind of understanding. Understand who the woman is and how she handles things emotionally, mentally, whatever. How does the woman handle things when she's under pressure? Bible said, dwell with a woman with understanding. Dwell with them means live with them with understanding. While you are courting a man, listen to me, young woman. If you are courting somebody and the person is not a man of understanding, I don't know why you're wasting your time with him. He will never understand you, not today, not tomorrow, till that kingdom comes. He will never understand. He wouldn't understand why after your bachelor's, you still want to go and get a master's degree and still want to do a PhD. What's your problem? Ain't you happy at where you are? <laughs> so, the Bible says the men should be what men of understanding, and they should be able to uh, give honor to the woman, to the wife. If you are courting somebody who does not honor you, honey, run, 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 run. Like the French would say, a toot, we can run. If they have already started dishonoring you in the courtship relationship, they will dishonor you in the marriage. My God. My God. The Bible says. The man should give you honor. The man should be an honorable man to give honor. If you're not honorable, you can't give honor. Yes, you can. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Give an honor. So that is point number four. We just, uh, we treated, um, what's it called? Understand it. Honorable. The man must be honorable. How does he even handle himself? Is he a man of his word? It says, yay, yay, nay, nay, or he's doing something different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's not a man of, of his word. His word is not bond. What, <laughs> why do you want to marry somebody who cannot keep his word? What makes you think you even keep the marriage vow? He will cheat on you. He will go after anything in skirt. My God, listen to me, young woman. He must be a man of honor. If he has honor, he will not give honor. If he doesn't have honor, he cannot honor you. What do we mean by honoring you, respecting you as a woman? I know people say the men should love the wife, but no woman wants to be disrespected. I don't know about you women watching, but nobody wants, no woman wants to be disrespected. Don't go and cheat on me with another woman and disrespect me. You are dishonoring me. Don't talk to me harshly anyhow in front of your friends. No honor. Don't embarrass me in front of your children. Like if you're married, a husband who does not honor the wife, the house is chaotic. There's work to be done in the home because you don't realize that, oh, I'm not supposed to maybe even rebuke my wife in front of my friends, rebuke my wife in front of my children, or you rebuke that woman you are dating in front of other people. Take her aside. Take her in. If you want to engage her, let me tell you, women, we talk. If you want to dishonor a woman, she will stand to defend her honor. Some women will. Some women don't. Some women, they don't mind. You can walk all over them. But some women, they will not tolerate you dishonoring them. So you're going to speak up. Somebody's like, well, is that right? Well, I'm not saying that's right. But you, you, my point is you, the man, set the tone. If you want a woman to honor you, honor her. Give. What does the Bible say? Give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, fresh down, shaken together. Will God cause men to give unto your bosom? It's not just money or wealth or resources. You give kind words, you get a good measure, you get a bad. You treat a woman nice, she presses down, shaken together, she gives you a double. What do we say? When a man gives a woman a seed, she takes this, she conceives the baby. She gives you a baby after nine months, isn't it? Exactly. So if you give her honor, she will honor you double, triple. If you dishonor her, you live to find out what it is. So the Bible says here, First Peter chapter 3, the same verse that the men should give honor to their wives as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life. So honor is important. Uh, make sure you have that in. So we said point number one, relationship with God. You have to have a relationship with God. Praise God that Christ is the head of man. First Corinthians 
offering. We said he should be the spiritual leader, a godly husband, and a spiritual leader of the home. Ephesians 5 23 is that you are the head, Christ is the head of you. You are an intercessor. You are the one praying. You are the one sanctifying the woman with the word of God. Point number two, we say you should be a loving husband and we talk about sacrificial love. Point number four, we say you should be a man of understanding, a man of understanding. Point number five, in case I did not um, number it properly in the beginning, get it right. Point number five, a man of honor. If the man is honorable of his word, of his action, does he have good ethics? A man who will lie and cheat, who would maneuver, who will circumvent the system, who will do things, cut short corners. They are not ethical. They are not honorable. You marry them, they'll go and lie, cheat, take somebody's position. They'll do things to, to, to defraud people. And now they're going to label you as a woman married to the defraudster. Well, you saw it before you married them. Why didn't you fix it? Exactly. So if they lie, if a man is lying to you while he's courting you, he's going to lie to you too. He goes to the grave. Don't marry a pathological lie. I don't like liars. I don't like lies. Speak the truth. Truth might hurt sometimes, but speak the truth. Like, ain't nobody gonna, you know, speak the truth. Let your, let, let, let ABA and BBB. Like, Jesus said, hellfire is for liars, adulterers, idolaters. God puts all of you in the same category. All these sins is in the same category. Why do you want to marry a liar? He tell you he's a at Tony's house, but he's over at Evelyn's house. <laughs> He'll tell you he's going for a business trip. No, but he's gone on a vacation with another woman. Liar, 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 and some fire. So you want to make sure that you are not marrying a liar. You must be a man of honor. Point number six. Point number six we want to make today. Point number six. The man is a provider. Point number six. That godly husband must provide. He must provide. Now, this is a very hairy thing because we live in different cultures and different cultures have different expectations. But I'm talking Bible culture here today. We're talking Bible. We're talking scriptures. What the scripture is saying or requiring uh, from you as a man. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith, my God, and it's worse than an unbeliever. God said, you the godly husband, you the one that has been made the head of the home, you are the provider of that house. If you fail to provide for the house, you are worse off than an unbeliever. My God, look at the comparison. You work. So you as a man, whether you are married or not, you should have that provider mentality with you. Provide for yourself, provide for your home. After all, you might provide and be a blessing to your own parents or your own siblings, nephews, nieces, cousins, whatever, grandparents. You have to be a provider. That means the man must love to work. Don't marry a lazy man. Listen, listen woman, if you are single, don't marry a lazy man. Don't, mar don't marry a man who doesn't want to work. Work is not part of their vocabulary. They are couch potato. They just want to sit down and have the remote and be clicking. They can't keep a job. They can only keep a job for a week. You look at their resume, they've had 10 jobs in a year. Why? Like, I don't understand some women sometimes. You see all these red flags and you convince yourself, oh, when I marry, he'll keep a job because now he's married. You lie to yourself. He's not going to keep a job. I'm sorry, man. He's not. <laughs> he will not. Why do we deceive ourselves? Marry a man who loves work. Why do I say that? Because it's God's first, one of God's first commandments in the Garden of Eden. When he told Adam to, and he said, well, will be fruitful and multiply. What was he telling them? Yes, procreation, have children. But he said, tend to the garden. Replenish it, subdue it, do all that. Wow. So what are we talking about here? A man who cannot work, as in keep a job or run a business, you have a problem. He's not going to provide for you. Provider is what is he providing? What do we talk about? Maslow's law. We you know the five things that we need. You need shelter, you need clothing, you need food, just the basic necessities of life. Can the man clothe himself? If he can't provide for himself, what makes him think he can provide for you? Man, man can provide for himself. He's not going to provide for you. So make sure that that godly man, godly spouse, has something to show for. Does he have a job? Does he have a business? Does he have ideas that he wants to put in place to? to make money, to generate income, generate revenue. That's what you're looking for. There are certain men, you might meet them in the beginning. I'm not saying that you can't marry, don't marry a poor person or whatever. Now, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about work ethic. They, they have work. 
You know, it's something I instill into my kids. I tell them, I said, you cannot call off work. You cannot say you're not going to work unless you are sick and you are bedridden or in the ER. You go, your word is your bond. You decided to work that shift. You better show up and work that shift. Maybe it's coming from my HR background or my pastoral background, but it is what it is. When you commit to do something, do it. I don't ever remember like working and be calling off like, no, if I'm calling off, that means I'm really sick, sick, sick to the point I can't come in. And that means not sick as let me take Adrian and lay down and sleep. Sick as I'm probably in the ER. I'm talking to somebody. What is the man's work ethic? Do they love to work? Do they like to make money? Do they like to earn income? Do they like to do something to bring resources in? If they are not in that category, if you're watching me as a young man and you have not married yet and you don't like work, start liking work. Get rid of that, that like a physical attitude. Start liking work. Work. Make money for your own self to be a blessing to your family, immediate family, and your extended family. Praise God. And so be a provider. The Bible says that if you cannot provide, you're worse than an unbeliever. You must provide. You must work. There are seasons where a man will go without a job. I'm not saying the woman shouldn't help. Women, we are here to help me. You may have a job, you may have work. I'm here. I'm bringing my contribution as well. What are we doing with it? At least if I contribute, I can help you get your destination quicker. I can help us to achieve our vision and our dreams in life. If I'm helping, I'm contributing. But don't look at me as I'm the breadwinner of the home. Now, in, in some cases, because of the woman's education or her experience or her job or business or whatever, she's making more. And so it kind of puts the man in a position of, okay, then you might as well take out the kids and raise them. I always talk about, like, those who are, like, um, stay-at-home dads, like, you know how, how blessed these kids are. Because they, like, the enforcer of the, of the, of the rules in the house is the one taking care of them. You can make the work of the woman sometimes so easy because, you know, the man is the one making sure kids are walking, they're straight and narrow, they're doing the right thing, they, they have discipline. Because, you know, women sometimes, I'm not saying women should spoil kids, but sometimes we give them a little leeway. Daddy will not do it. Unless, of course, the man is also weak and he can't do jack. Like, that's a problem. I'm talking about a godly husband here. Amen. So, women, yes, you work, help the man. In some homes in the West, I don't know about, you know, we have the African culture, the Asian culture, the Western culture, and whatever American culture you want to call it. You know, it's different. In some cultures, they, they believe the woman should work, bring, they bring her paycheck to the man. The man controls everything. She has no say so. The man tells you, yeah, take $20 for the week. That's for you. After you earn $1,000, i am going to give you 20 Hold on to it. I don't know what's going on in your home, but I'm not here to advocate for that. I'm here to say. Because I'm going by the Proverbs 31 woman. She was industrious. She had her own money. She was helping. She was doing things that even made the city elders praise her husband at the gate. She was an investor. She was a provider. She was a home. That whole deal. So if the woman is a Proverbs 21, that is a Proverbs 31 woman. And you're the man you are providing. You're working. What a glorious home that will be. Because then you're able to do that. Praise God. And so it's important. Man, be able to be a provider. Okay? Be a provider. Glory be to God. Um, point number seven, and we're wrapping up today. Point number seven, or maybe I'll give it. Point number seven, you want to make sure you're marrying a man who's faithful. A man who is faithful. Faithfulness. God demands that we should be faithful. God demands that we should be men of our word, women of our word. If the person is faithful to God, he'll be faithful to you. When I say faithful, one woman. He doesn't have 10 side chicks. He doesn't have 20 mistresses. You are number five in all the side chicks. No, it's, we are not doing that. Like if you're a man, my point is, if you don't love that woman, don't waste your time. Don't try to bring other people into the relationship. You are cheap. Once a cheap, always a cheap. Will forever be a cheap. Unless God transforms them. Unless they are born again. They're walking with the Holy Spirit. And they are really deeply rooted in the word that they will not cheat. So if you're dating somebody who is a womanizer, he's not going to change. If you're already married to somebody who is a womanizer, I have a solution for you. Take it to God in prayer. Lift him before God. Because maybe you didn't know all these things before you got married, but you're encountering these challenges. There's a trajectory uh, uh, introduced into the relationship, a strange fire. We pray for you. We stand with you in prayer. I pray that God will expose that affair. And God will deliver that man from that trajectory. And God will cut off every spirit of lust that's operating in that marriage. So you guys can stay together. So you guys can be together and can be faithful. So the man has to be faithful and faithful husband, a faithful husband. This is episode number 23. 
Episode 24, I want to talk about, still a godly husband, but I want to talk about marrying somebody in the fivefold ministry. Marrying somebody in ministry. This is where the problems are. If you look on social, on social media right now, you look at a lot of churches, if you look at a lot of marriages, people marry to those in ministry. We are struggling. There are challenges. We want to look at that kind of a marriage, that kind of a husband, that kind of a wife. Marrying into the fivefold ministry, what we can learn from it, what we can avoid. So, if you're out there, you say, I want to marry a pastor, I want to marry a bishop, I want to marry an apostle, I want to marry a prophetess, I want to marry a prophet. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> We're going to look at it in episode 24, and I pray we can learn some key things that will help improve marriages, that will help those in the fivefold ministry to be more effective in what God has called us to do, and also be effective in the home, effective in the pulpit, and effective in the house. To God be the glory. Thank you for watching today. I love, I love all of you. All the emojis going up. The thank you, the amens. Hallelujah. God bless you. All my destiny helpers are out there. God bless you. I see you over there. I have been blessed. Every time you guys come on here, you encourage me. They keep coming to your home. They keep coming with the word. I love to preach the word, teach the word so that somebody's life can be better. Let's transform lives. Maybe you might not have the time to preach, but you can share this video with somebody else. I want you to direct people. Let them like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's Rev Rose Dinoa. On Facebook, it's Rev Rose Dinoa, unless you're on my personal page. But share, like, follow, comment. Let me know how this is blessing you. In fact, send me three things you learn from a godly husband that you think will be applicable in your life or somebody else's life. Comment on YouTube, comment on Facebook, let us know, and I know it will be a blessing. Next week, Tuesday, God, well, at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I will be back with episode number 24 here on Refreshing Time talking about uh, ministry um, based marriage, people who are married to those in the fivefold ministry. I love you, appreciate you. Have a wonderful weekend, y'all. God bless you.